great pleasure that I invite our guest speaker, Prof. Uh, Professor John Visser from the University of, of Northampton to take the stage. He's agreed to take perhaps two or three short questions after he's spoken, so if you want to draft something, uh, feel free, but we won't have time for a lot. Right. Is it working? Can you hear me at the rack? Yeah. Good. You're a scary lot. <laughs> Secondary teachers. Yeah, right. Um, you've asked me to, to come and thank you for that. Um, it's not an easy topic. And uh, it's fairly controversial. So if I say anything to upset you and you want to walk out, please do, but shout rubbish and spell it with three Bs. So I know I've got off to a wrong start. If you want a copy of the presentation because you want to use it, throw darts at it or do whatever you do with presentations, because I know if you write notes, you will not look at them again. So, you know, um, then if you send me an email and you ask for inclusion, policy, principle, process or physical feeling, uh, I'll send you the whole presentation. OK, so there's no need to copy down what you think are complete rubbish PowerPoints. <clears throat> What I do ask is that you provide a comment on the presentation. Thought provoking, load of rubbish, won't work in my school, whatever. So, John Visser, northampton.ac.uk, ask for inclusion, you'll get the full package. I want to start by <coughs> saying, first of all, that um, I'm probably not going to say an awful lot that's new. We've had masses of change in education. Uh, unlike some of you, unless you're here as a retired capacity, I've got 48 years of experience in education as a teacher, lecturer, professor, researcher, whatever you want to title you want to put against my name. I still teach on a voluntary basis. And what I'm discovering, the older I get, is that there is actually nothing new in education that you can come up with. You can talk to me about iPads, you can talk to me about computers, you can even talk to me about teaching through YouTube. Actually, when you break it all down, teaching relies on one essential characteristic. And inclusion relies on that characteristic absolutely. And that is the nature of the relationship between teacher and taught. Without, you know, we're not going to get there by flooding the market with, with iPads, useful as they are. So, some things old, some things borrowed, a few things new, and a reminder of the things that we do well, and a reminder, if you need it, that I am no expert. What I'm prepared to do with you for the next 40 odd minutes is share my 48 years of experience. Expert, the English definition of it, I doubt whether it changes in Scotland, but the English definition of an expert, X means you can no longer do it, and a spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> so I've got some themes running through. First of all, there are challenges in deciding what. Do we have a shared language? Do you have a shared language? When tomorrow morning you are debating two motions on inclusion, will you all have the same notion of what inclusion means when you have that debate? Because a lot of the arguments about inclusion are about people having different definitions of what inclusion is and then having a row about it. There are challenges in deciding whom. Who are the unincluded, the non-included, the excluded? Seduction of labels. We know what to do. The challenge, colleagues, is in finding ways of doing it. And finding ways of doing it as you are debating as a union, you know, in times when money is short, 
We are not loved. We are not respected in the way we were 50 years ago in the olden days of teaching. And being a teacher meant something in your community and now, no, you know, you're somewhere just above policemen, but not far. <laughs> and what I want to try and do is make you reflect about your school, your colleagues, your bit of the union. What's the language you use about children? And how does that language and that understanding translate itself into inclusive policy and inclusive practice? And I'm going to start with looking at the curriculum. Now, I don't know if we've got any history of education people in the audience. OK, well, you're going to get two minutes of history then. How did education start in Scotland? Well, way back in the caveman days, there was Bruce the Scot. And there was a little tribe up in the Trossachs. And they had a problem. And their problem was that saber-toothed tigers were eating all the offspring. So they're having to produce more and more offspring because... So they said, what are we going to do about this? And they decided that Bruce was quite good at dealing with saber-toothed tigers. So they said, Bruce, would you get all the kids into the back of the cave and tell them about saber-toothed tigers. Bruce did. The death rate fell. The problem was, Bruce died. But Bruce had two sons. Bruce the one and Bruce the two. Now, Bruce the one was very good at understanding the ecology of saber-toothed tigers. And Bruce, the two, was very good at pit digging and sharpening the stakes to catch the tigers. So they said, OK, Bruce, the one, you go and teach them that. And Bruce, the two, you go and teach them that. And the death rate fell again. They died. Bruce, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth came to them. You see where I'm going? We have to remember that what we have done, and I'm not saying it's not we shouldn't have done it, I'm saying let's realise what we've done in terms of inclusion. We've created groups of children. We're saying, you're five, you can't be with five, you're six-year-olds. You're seven, you should be doing this at seven. You're a boy, you should be doing that. You're a girl, you should be... We've got away from that just about. But let's not kid ourselves too much on that one. We created groups. You teach groups of children. At secondary school, somebody in your school spends most of the uh, summer term. In my day, they were given the, the half, the, half the term off to go home and write the timetable, which didn't work when they came back. We create subjects. Oh, you can't do that in English because you've got to do it in mathematics. You can't do pi diagrams in geography because you've got to be taught how to draw them in mathematics. Why aren't the English teachers telling them how to write a program or a, or a, or a process or a story or whatever in full stops and capital letters? Right? So we've created groups, one set of barriers, and subjects, another set of barriers. I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm saying that's what we've done. Into that, we create experts. Well, I'm a geography teacher. I can't possibly do music. I'm an art historian. You want me to teach some French? We've created outcomes. Your general secretary has just mentioned that dreaded word. I mean, standards, we are told, are not what they would, were. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the great Ted Rag. Uh, from Exeter University, who I had the privilege of working with, um, who said, if you actually clocked all the backward steps that the politicians and the media say have happened in schools, we are now in some sort of minus quantity. You know, spelling has fallen, handwriting has fallen, reading scores have fallen, boom, 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 boom. 
We are the 292nd of the 4,000 schools in the world. <clears throat> Lee said soon's mended on that one. What we've done then is created educational systems, and we are part of that system. And into doing that, what we've created is the included and the excluded divide. I'm not saying we were maliciously doing it. I'm saying that's where we have arrived at. And so to be part of the solutions, as somebody said on the stage just now, we need to understand our part in the problem. What inclusion isn't? If you want to have some fun when you get back, and, and your staff or head or whoever is saying, well, you had a jolly good jolly over the weekend, now get down to work. Just put a, a, a flip chart up in the staff room. Right across the top of the flip chart, inclusion is, and give everybody a post-it, and ask them to complete the sentence. If you have a staff who all write the same sentence, you are unique in the world. I have never had it happen. Are you talking about inclusion or integration? It's important to be clear between these items because they provide a point of distinction between systems and processes and procedures, interactions and relationships. It's very interesting that in the English language, we do not talk about re-inclusion, we talk about reintegration. Hold that thought for a moment. What does that mean? <clears throat> With integration, the education system exists and the child is negotiated into it. We want people to be integrated into our society. What does that mean? It means we want them to change to fit what we think should happen. Not a bad thing. We're Scottish after all. Well, some of us are. I'm Dutch. So, you know. <coughs> the onus is on the child to fit the system. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying that's where the onus is. Inclusive education, on the other hand, starts from the child's right to belong. And that's where all the problems start. Because I, I, I just want to tell you an amazing fact, colleagues, which you won't have realised. Children are different. I'm only getting a few nods. Some of you are getting worried. <laughs> oh my God, are they really, John? <laughs> I've been teaching all this time. Yeah? Children are different and they have a right to belong. The assumption is that the education is inclusive and hence there is no requirement for any child's right of entry has to be, no, uh, be negotiated. So my starting point in talking about inclusion is all children should be included. Now before anybody says, John, you want to meet the little bugger I've got on Friday afternoons? <laughs> Jesus, you know. <coughs> I'm not saying it is easy. I am not even saying it is entirely possible. In my professional life, I have worked with children, some of which have had hit headlines nationally. And not for reasons which are terribly savoury. And they are very disturbed children. And their schools spotted them many moons ago. And their schools tried to do something for them and it didn't work. There are some children for whom inclusion in a mainstream setting is just not possible. But before anybody says, Hallelujah, John, God, can I say that to my head this week for the 25 children I want excluded? No, you can't. <laughs> it's about 0.5% <coughs> of any population that I would apply that to. One of the large studies that I did with colleagues about inclusion 
exclusion, sorry. We went and talked to kids who'd been excluded, and without exception, I repeat that, without exception, they all said there was one member of staff who they got on with and who thought that they were okay. That says something about us and our schools. So, inclusion is widely used in education, seldom defined, as I said. Just try it out in your own school. Or maybe even tomorrow morning, dare I suggest this to you, before you debate tomorrow morning, put two flip charts up, give everybody a, flip, uh, uh, a post it, and say, how would you finish that sentence? Inclusion is. When you read the literature, it can be seen as a place, usually meaning a mainstream, <laughs> or if you're reading American literature, a regular school. I don't know about any of you folks, but if I was asked, I'd rather attend an irregular school than a regular one, but that's me. It's a process. John, it's difficult and we're working on it. It's a principle. How many of you have got an inclusion statement written into one policy or other in the school? I believe in, you know, it's, it's all like being in church, you know. I believe in God the Almighty. I believe in inclusion. <laughs> Everybody nods sagely. And we, I used to do a lot of work on differentiation, colleagues, and um, one of the things I did was, was try and explore that. <clears throat> and I was very privileged because my uh, partner was the senior HMI for England for special ed, and she called together a whole lot of her HMI colleagues. <clears throat> and um, I said to them, uh, what's differentiation? And without exception, they all said, it's something we believe in, John. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, okay. Yeah? It's a state of being. I like this one. This is where you know, it starts to touch me. It's the feeling of being included. It's a set of practices which are inclusive. It's something that is difficult to achieve, and these, all those things may not be mutually exclusive. But as you debate inclusion, think to yourself, where do I stand on this? What's my moral value position? You want to look at inclusion as a place? <coughs> Hut, special education unit, <coughs> fence, Secondary school. Inclusion? Well, let's watch. watch. Watch the cartoon. If you don't do anything else, watch the cartoon. What's the evidence to say that putting all children with special educational needs into mainstream is OK and good? There isn't any. Before you all rejoice, there is no evidence to say not doing it is good either. We woefully lack good, hard evidence on the practice of inclusion. And as I was saying, is inclusion uh, in the sense of place actually going to fit all the children that we've got? They are very different. And we do deal with some very dam damaged and difficult youngsters. And by the time they come through to secondary school, they are very damaged and very difficult. Why? Because primary schools are nice, caring places. That's not to say secondary schools aren't. It's to say primary, it's a bit more, and I don't wish to sound disparaging, but it's a bit more cuddly. And I say that working in a primary school currently. And when you get to year seven, or for you it's, um, I've forgotten what it is for you, tw year 12? Uh, whatever. You, you know what I mean. When you get into secondary school, shit hits fan. <laughs> These subject things come across, you've got, you've, got, you've got a whole lot of things that you've got to process. And, and if you've got difficulties at home and you haven't had breakfast and you've come in and your dad's been beating up your <coughs> mum and you're the 13th child of a one-parent family with the loo at the bottom of the garden over the river and somebody says, morning Johnny, we're going to have a lovely day. Oh shit. That's real politique, isn't it? That's Monday morning. How many of you have been in my situation on a Friday at 3 o'clock 
and a child refusing to go home because he's had a good time in school all week and weekends are just rubbish. The power of what we can provide for our children by good quality teaching is immense. Not because they go off and get research degrees and God knows what else, but because we give them resilience and an understanding of themselves that they can take forward. We don't give them the fishing rod, that's the GCSE or the standards or the whatever. We teach them how to fish. And who are these not included? Less than 2%. Prior to a number of changes in recent times, less than 2% of children were not in mainstream school. <coughs> if 20% of children in our populations have special educational needs, 18% were in mainstream schools, and you were teaching them. And you were teaching them well until somebody all of a sudden popped their head up and said, do you know he's got learning difficulties? And you say, yeah, well, I thought he was a bit of a slow learner. And then there's a whole argument about schooling and place. Is, is place inclusion? Is putting a child in a mainstream school inclusion? Or does that happen? You weren't watching the cartoon, were you? I'll go back. Watch the cartoon. For many, many instances, inclusion is moving the hut from outside the fence into the back of the classroom or school. And for many years, I taught such classes. 3H3 in a nine form entry school. Work it out. And as I said, the quality of what's going on needs to be questioned. So defining it, inclusion is the failing derived from being included. Nothing happens. Nothing at all. You can put me in the uniform. Like McDonald's do, or any other retail outfit. Now you have to have the uniform, don't you? And that's meant to, and it gives a certain something. I belong to St. Michael's on the hill. Or as one child said to me, I belong to St. Michael's over the hill, sir. <coughs> Nothing happens until I feel <coughs> included. So being included is an interactional event between people who value each other. The point at which, and it happens, and I'm not blaming anybody, the point at which we stop valuing the child is the point at which we say, no, you shouldn't be here. Exclude him. Bum, 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 bum. At that point, the child is not included. Inclusion is supported by involvement in processes and an entitlement to an appropriately resourced place. And yes, you're going to tell me, John, we are under-resourced now, and goodness only knows what's going to happen. I know. But I'm also here standing before you to tell you that you will make a difference. I know. I see it. My research tells me that. You make an enormous difference to the outcome of children. Even though you are underpaid, undervalued, under-resourced, under-falling schools that have been not properly built or whatever is happening in Scotland at the moment. Forms of provision within broad parameters do not appear to be important in terms of outcome and progression. I, I would hesitate to use that particular statement if we were in Edinburgh at the moment. Um, because, yes, you know, buildings do matter, do they not, colleagues? But the number of times in my 48 years of teaching and being in education where I've seen a school that was in appalling conditions doing outstanding work, move to a new building with everything electronic and whizzing and everything else, and the standards fall right down. I don't understand fully the logic of that, but it happens. Different forms of provision are seen by young people to have been successful. Well, I've got about 120 schools represented here. 
besides 120 groups of schools, you all have different schools. Yeah, we call them a secondary school. I don't know if how many of you have been privileged enough, as I have over my teaching career, to visit large numbers of schools around the world. I've never come across two schools that are the same. They have this title, secondary education, but they're not the same. Success appears to have common characteristics that are not associated with the form of provision, but it's human delivery. What are teachers? They are human deliverers. So what achieves inclusion? When you start debating tomorrow, this is the sorts of things that I think should be at, at least in the back of your mind. You're talking about thinking, talking, listening, and dynamic schools. You're talking about leadership. Yes, I can be inclusive in my own little corner with my 32,000 children who are crammed into my spot doing geography with me. And we can have a really fun time. But you need some leadership which understands the value of relationships. You need an engaged, relevant, and differentiated and participant curriculum. When I was doing the work on differentiation, <coughs> I did a lot about um, different teaching styles and different learning styles. And on one occasion, a, a member of my audience stood up and he said, um, he said, I don't understand anything you're talking about. So I said, well, how did the children in your class learn? I teach them, he said. I said, that's interesting, sir. And what happens when they don't learn? I still bloody teach them, he said. <laughs> it's a curious, you know, notion of what teaching and learning is. That it's, you know, that there's two sides. There's, I teach and you learn. And my analogy for that is, give me a 50p coin, slice it down that way, give you the heads, you the tails, have I got 50p? No. You have to have both, and they are a dynamic. And the emphasis on meeting individual educational needs. John, do you realise how many children I see in a week? We're a school of 800. I do all the French. Blessings. I have 800 textbooks to mark a week, John. You want me to treat them as individuals? Yes. Difficult as that is, we have to find ways of seeing the individual in the crowd and making the individual in the crowd realise that we're on them. Not because I, my eyes are on you, but because you're valued. It's predicted. By 2020, schools will have a greater variation in pupils. By the way, I don't agree with this. I think we've had a variation in pupils for God knows how long, you know? But that's what the... Right? And inclusion gives rise to its own tensions. So when, again, when you're debating tomorrow, where are you going to stand on this one? Well, John, <clears throat> we've got to increase our standards. We've got to be better than England and Finland. Yeah, well, if you want to be better in Finland, then you know, realise how the Finns do it. Yeah? In Finland, if you're not in school and not making progress, all your family benefits are withdrawn. Oh, yeah, nasty, horrible, whoop! You know, do we want that sort of a society? Do you, who said yes? <laughs> I, I feel for you because um, it, it is an enormous pressure on, on your colleagues who you represent. It's an enormous pressure on them. And, um, and my view is you know, find a way of keeping the pressure here and not here so it doesn't affect the day to day. I know it will do. I know you'll get to Friday and you think, oh, shut up, I, I wish I could have a work-life balance over the weekend. You know? I know that. 
I've been there, I still am there to some extent. But if we don't tackle that challenge, children will suffer. Academic standards versus difficulties in learning. What's a difficulty in learning? Not learning the way the teachers taught me. Oh yeah, there's a few eyebrows going up. Oh, that's a bit controversial, John. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. You're a special needs teacher, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> it's gin, <Jin> too. <coughs> yeah. Hold that thought in your heads. A difficulty in learning <coughs> is caused by the way the teacher teaches. That's really hard, John. You know, come on. But when you think about it, it's true. That doesn't make us bad people. It means we need to think a bit more carefully about how we teach different children different things. Now, do you want challenging behaviour or do you want compliance? Oh, God, John, give me compliance any day. I just <laughs> love to walk into a class. They all stand up and say, good morning, sir. We are about to start with you on page 23. We have every piece of equipment with us and we will take full part in this lesson. I suggest you, you turn and run out of the classroom at that point. <laughs> Something's happened. <laughs> have they put something in the water? Are you going to have cultural acceptability or are you going to rely on medical technology? One of the things that's happened in my time in education is that now many more children with quite severe disabilities are now alive and they're coming into my classroom. When I started teaching Down syndrome children, or what we called in those days Mongols, which I always got confused with the lot just south of China, <laughs> you know, they, they weren't in school and if they got to 11 they were lucky. Now they go right way through and that's medical technology. Children are surviving now because of medical technology. What about the ideals versus the pragmatic? John, I'll sign up. You, what you're saying is something that I totally agree with. I'll sign up to it now. Boom, 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 boom. Against the pragmatics. John, I'm a very busy teacher. They've just taken two frees off me. <coughs> They've cut my budget by 25%. Um, I've now not got a, a, another teacher in my department, and I'm the sole person. I've got 800. And you want me to what? Yeah, <coughs> I do. Because the children in your class, at any one time, only have that time with you. And you want to change? Or are you just going to carry on doing what you've always done? I think if I do eventually fully retire, which my wife wants me to do, one of the things I will go to my grave regretting is not finding how to change teachers every time. It is one of the most difficult tasks that faces us as professionals. Becoming better teachers. <clears throat> Who are the excluded then? If anybody in this room does not teach one of these children, I shall be mightily surprised. Most of the children who get excluded are boys. You see, you girls have very subtle ways of pleasing teachers, particularly male teachers. One of the things that's happening at the moment is, as we're getting more and more female dominated within the profession, we are increasingly getting more and more difficult because they can't flash their eyelids at you and get away with it. I know, by the way, if any of you want to have the perfect class, my last slide will show you how to have the perfect class. Some children from most minority ethnic backgrounds. Notice I say some children. When we did a study of children excluded, 
one of the very surprising things on a national study in, U in England was that children with a Chinese or Indian subcontinent background were very rarely excluded. Some of those who moved from place to place. <coughs> what in some communities are called the incomers. I moved to my current village in 1989. It's a very small little village in North Yorkshire. I'm just about becoming accepted. Yeah? I'm one of the outcomers. Some of those who use English, or in your case, Scottish, as an additional language. I'm Dutch. As a five-year-old, I was dropped into an English school with no English. I can tell you how scary that is. It's scarred in my head. How scary it is. It's made me the psychologist I am. Because what I did was put my back against the wall and just watch to find out. You know, you teachers say some daft things. Sit up straight. And I looked at kids sitting up straight, and none of them did. They'd all got arched backs. You know? Those who are neglected or abused at home, and that's a bigger number than you think it is. And many children are very, very good at hiding it. Most young people are in the care of the local authority. Most of those whose behaviour challenges schools and teachers. Oh, now we're talking, John. That's the group I'm thinking of. They are a challenge, but they're not impossible. Those with a medical condition, ah oh yes, John, well, they're in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy, speech defect, and a twitch. Shouldn't be in school, you know. Just look at two sets of people in our communities. Those in the Paralympics and those in the Invicta Games. And then say to yourself, what are we doing with some of our children with disabilities who we've labelled, oh, he's got ADHD, which I don't think exists, but that's another lecture altogether. Some of those with a memory or a physical impairment, some of those with a cognitive impairment, some of those with a combination of any of the above. The key component of all of those children is that they have a difficulty in learning in the way in which we teach. That doesn't make us ogres, colleague. I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying let's begin to realise that how we teach actually creates problems for some of the children. How many of you have ever taught in a way which makes no sense to you whatsoever? The problem, colleagues, is that we believe it makes sense to the children. So, pedagogic school. <coughs> In the work, some of the work that I've been doing, and amongst not just me, but other colleagues have been doing, looking at inclusion, is do the school's values embrace diversity and does it practice what it promotes? Lots of schools have got policies on diversity and inclusion and disability, special educational needs. And it was written by the head teacher 15 years ago, and it's there gathering dust in the file. And if something goes wrong, the head says, well, we've got an inclusion policy or we've got a special needs policy. No, what's the practice in school? You may want to shoot me down on this, but one of the privileges that I have is going into schools like yours. And I can tell you, it hits me here within 30 seconds of the school. You know, this is a school which values people, where children matter. So, possible indicators. How are the values of the school reflected in your curriculum, your resources, your communications, your procedures, and your conduct? How people talk and treat each other <coughs> in school? How staff talk to each other, how staff talk to children, particularly the difficult ones. 
the leadership provided by senior staff and the consistency of staff behaviour. What the school intends and tries to do for people like me. We ask this question of, ch of children and young people. And one of the things that they, they, they relate everything back to themselves. Like many of us do when we're adults. The school's understanding of how well different individuals and groups do in school. We've got a lot better at this over the years, haven't we? You've no doubt got a computer program somewhere where every time you mark a child's piece of work, uh, you have to log it in the computer and it whizzes off and then there's a massive graph drawn at the end and we say, oh, we're making fantastic progress. <laughs> we can show on the graph, it's gone zunk. No, but how do children know? How do children feel about that? The steps taken to make sure that particular individuals and groups are not disadvantaged in school. Just on the, on the whole range of, 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 of gender now, the issues of transgender, homosexuality, maleness. We're moving into an area where we've got a lot of issues coming through now. How do we treat those different people? What's your school strategy for promoting good relationships and managing behaviour in school? So some quick, quick questions for your next staff meeting. And I will race through these. Why do pupils learn? Well, they come to my school, Tom. <laughs> they come to your school to meet their mates. Don't delude yourself. They do not come up the path walking to, isn't it great, I've got Mrs Jones this morning and we're going to do history. No, they'll say, it's great, we're doing Mrs. Jones today, and she's lovely. And oh, by the way, did you see the telly last night? What was a football? How do your children learn? And how did you learn to teach? Do you know one of the most worrying statistics about us as teachers? Is that within five years of leaving training college, you will revert to teaching how you were taught. A staggering. Unless, like me, you took an oath. No child will ever suffer what I suffered in school. How do you develop your teaching strategies? When was the last time you had a staff meeting that talked about teaching strategies and not, well, have we got the loose washed? Or what's the next policy document we've got to get done? What governs the use of a particular teaching strategy? How do the pupils learn? Or is your answer that is, I teach them. And that's unchallengeable. I teach, you learn. You have to believe that learning behaviour can change. We are getting a lot better. There's a lot more teaching children how to learn rather than what to learn. The what is secondary almost. We need behaviour patterns and behaviour strategies which prevent the behaviour from happening in the first place. I guarantee you that if you stood at your school gate on a Monday morning and watched the children come in, you would know immediately, as they come through the door, which children are going to give what teachers problems that day. Their demeanour, what they bring in them with them, how they shuffle past you and won't make eye contact. What do we do? We wait for the problem. I have two flat coat retrievers. For those of you who don't know, those are dogs and they're fairly big, they're fairly boisterous. One of them's 11 months old. If I am not ahead of the game with my flat coat retrievers, they are misbehaving. I get annoyed. I could have cut it off at the pass. We need to give children instructional reactions. And we have got better at that part. You certainly need transparency and communication. Do children really understand what you're saying to them? Or have they mechanics 
of body posture which indicates to you that they do. I'll show you that in a minute. They need empathy and not sympathy. It is no good going up to the child and saying, there, there, <coughs> you are the 13th child of a one-parent family with a loo at the bottom of the garden, your granny and Alf went down the dog died yesterday. I do understand. You don't. Most of us, even when we come from very difficult situations, haven't had some of the experiences the children we teach deal with on a daily basis. They do need boundaries and they do need challenge, and it needs to be an appropriate challenge, an achievable challenge. But they also need boundaries. I'm not one for laissez-faire. The first time I teach a class, we sit when I say, we pick up our pens when I say, we breathe when I say. I'm to the right of Genghis Khan. <laughs> because I can then ease off. But I've set boundaries. Children need boundaries. Otherwise, what can they rebel against? It must be positive relationships. And you've got to do it with humour. That doesn't mean to say you've got to be a stand-up comedian at their own game. It's no accident, colleagues, that many of our nationally revered and loved stand-up comedians were teachers and that many of our teachers are stand-up comedians. <laughs> <coughs> An education inclusive school, then, is one which, which the teaching and learning, achievements, attitudes and well-being of every young person matters. Every young person matters. Effective schools are educationally inclusive schools. This shows not only in their performance, but also in their ethos and in their willingness to offer new opportunities to pupils who may experience previous difficulties with us. This does not mean treating all pupils in the same way. Rather, it involves taking account of pupils' varied life experiences and needs. So to conclude, <coughs> how to realize you have the perfect class? Five things. They don't do it when they train teachers, but all of you teachers know it. There's, you've all got characters like that, haven't you? Appropriate head, meaning, head movements. You've really enjoyed this lecture immensely, haven't you? Yes. You'll never do that again, will you? Neither of those head movements made that, mean that. They know from about year f R in, in, uh, in England. So, you know, reception class. Reception class teachers teach children by their actions that those movements are important. When an adult approaches you and you don't want them to really know what's going on, you nod or you shake your head. And when you get to secondary age, you add her uh, <laughs> in there as well. Always write on the line with the date. This is how girls get away with it in school. God, it's colour-coded and printed neatly, and you think it must be good. <laughs> Never mind the quality, feel the width, John. You must be able to Google. This evening's homework is in Tyrannosaurus Rex. Next morning, 30 copies of Tyrannosaurus Rex land on your desk, all the same. You nod sagely and say, oh, yes, OK, they've done Tyrannosaurus Rex. You must be able to walk, not run. It is an established fact, colleagues. If you run out of school, the head will press some bell or other and come chasing after you. As one child said to me, he said, I don't go to lessons, sir. I said, what do you do? He said, I've got a clipboard, sir. He says, and after I've done morning assembly, I walk out of school with a clipboard. And they all think I'm doing a survey. <laughs> he said, if I run, sir, he said they'd be after me. <laughs> now we laugh, but just think about that, yeah? 
and always tell the teacher what he or she told you. Never tell a teacher you've found another way of doing it. My God, that's scary. God, I've spent three hours teaching you that the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides, blah, blah, blah. And you're telling me, no, sir, it's just the way it is. You've got those five things. Don't assume children are learning. Nor assume that they are included in your lessons. What they have effectively done is build a little wall around them which means you feel good and gives them the freedom to bugger you off. <laughs> so the exclusion, if you want a problem to have in 2016, um, that you feel these um, extra support, more resources, more money, less children in class, um, don't go for any of the usual ones. Okay? Don't go for autism, dyslexia, old hat. What you want is this. If it comes up, dissuggestophobia. Okay? It's the ability to choose, to suggest to adults that you can choose when to behave appropriately, thus securing a diagnosis of selective ADHD, ODD, OCD, SEVD, BSD, SEMH. It's not the label that matters, it's the child behind the label. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Professor John Visser for a very entertaining, engaging, <coughs> humorous and above all uh, inclusive uh, talk. They enjoyed that very much. Uh, we've got a moment. We haven't got a lot of time, but uh, if there are any uh, pertinent questions which uh, anybody feels they would like to ask, uh, so we, have, we, have, we do have a moment or two. Um, John has to shoot off. He's got another engagement he has to go to, but uh, if there are any questions, please raise your hand and we'll get the roving mic to you, I hope. Here comes Ian with the microphone. Uh, John, Paul Cochran from, uh, I'm not going to tell you where I'm from in case you get me back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said that um, the golden age of education was 50 years ago and that you started teaching 48 years ago. <laughs> yeah, you care to comment on the damage you've done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I can tell you, have you heard about the school that had to call the army into Quella Rebellion? <laughs> it actually happened in 1850 at Harrow. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you know, we look back and we think that all children in those days were, were good and saintly and, you know, but they weren't, and nor were you. I mean, how I didn't get excluded from my school, I don't know. I think the head knew who'd put the rat down the side of the thing and <laughs> caused a, a, a health emergency. Um, but uh, he never actually, you know, collared me. He did other things for me, for which I bless him enormously. I wish I could go back and thank him. And that's one of our problems as teachers, isn't it? We teach in an age when um, everybody thinks that the world is now a, a more difficult place and a more scary place, but actually it's the same as it was 50 years ago a hundred years ago. There are differences, yes, we can now sit at nice desks and we can drink water that's clean and we've got iPads and, and we can go on YouTube when we have got a, a lesson we've got to teach which you don't know too much about and, and, and use a TED talk to start it off. <laughs> Haven't you done that? Oh. Um, but essentially, the children are the same as they were 50 years ago. And essentially, we are the same as it were 50 years. And essentially, learning is the same as it was 50 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Indeed, let's uh, give him a round of applause. Thank you.